So for me today, the key highlights of our discussion uh, related to um, an attempt to look at the differentiation of the emerging and the recently emerged therapies. So specifically, what we did today was try to have a uh, 30,000 foot view or global view of the field of emerging and emerged, recently emerged therapies. Um, by examining uh, the interleukin 17s, uh, looking at uh, the uh, P40 IL-1223 Eustachinumab Stellara, and also uh, you know, as a bridge to looking at the new um, interleukin 23. So it was quite interesting. When you try to do this in two ways, we did it in an evidence base and then kind of an eminence base. So the evidence base to it was that we looked at the pivotal results for the interleukin 17s, and what comes across is that the POSSE 75 IgA um, co primary endpoints, all of these studies looked at week 12, and it was important as we looked at these to raise a few caveats. We basically said, you know, you gotta make sure these are done similar study design, same statistical endpoints. Um, have we uh, controlled for the fact the patient populations were the same? Uh, so, so these are a number of the considerations you have to have and recognizing that when you do these even evidence-based analysis that they're not done in a head-to-head -head fashion. Having said that, it's natural to look at the data that's out there and try to kind of see where it all fits. And with those caveats in hand, we truthfully thought that amongst the IL-17s, the efficacy range, secukinumab at primary endpoint is you know, around uh, 77, 82% to ixikizumab around the 80, up to, up to 89%, uh, 90%, and for brodalumab still in the 80% range. So really what we're seeing is drugs that are in approximately this 80% POSSE 75, which is a step up from what we've had with TNF antagonists. Now, of course, the caveat here is that the peak efficacy looks like it's a little later than week 12. It looks like it's probably week 16 or maybe a little later. And if you look at data that has those endpoints, we're seeing you know, upwards for secukinumab, we saw uh, into the 80, 90% range, um, and also for exekizumab, brodalumab. So it's really hard to differentiate these drugs when you look at efficacy. Um, as we look at um, dosing, uh, again, we're looking at uh, drugs that are given generally uh, every month once they're in maintenance, the induction regimens, are a little different between them, but, but they're monthly. Uh, and the question came up, and here's where the eminence comes up, is there's, there can be a difference in countries between what's labeled dosing and what is actually done. And so Eustachinumab or Stellara is a classic example of that. The labeled dose after induction is to give it by weight less than 100 kilograms, greater than 100 kilograms, either 45 or 90 every 12 weeks. In reality, in many parts of the world, in Europe in particular, certainly in Canada, in some parts of the US, there's a tendency to give it every eight weeks, even though that may not be by label. So the question will become then for the interleukin 17s, will we be able to use, instead of every monthly dose, every two week dosing for ixikizumab and for secukinumab? And certainly there's clinical studies ongoing that, is, that are looking at that. So I think the um, efficacy, absolute level of efficacy, uh, we're seeing uh, this range, difficult to discriminate, rapid onset, high effect, and then durability is probably one of the most important things we discussed as being relevant to the use of these drugs. Um, by durability, uh, we're looking at the ability to maintain efficacy, and it's always very important to look at how we're reporting that data statistically. Non-responder imputation is the preferred method up to a year. Beyond that, it becomes a, a question of what the best endpoint is, um, but to standardize results across. Uh, and, and what we're seeing, and this we saw this at first with Eustachinumab, with Stellara, was that the, that the durability of these newer molecules seems to be excellent. We're retaining a majority of patients um, at these high levels. Now the other element of efficacy that although these weren't primary endpoints, 
was that PASI90 and PASI100 with these new molecules, um, we're seeing ranges of around 25 to about 40 percent achieving a PASI100, which is clear. PASI90 around 70 percent. So again, a step up from what we've had. A uh, step up has been shown even from one of the most effective drugs we have, uh, Stelera, used to Kinumab, uh, done in a head-to-head -head fashion with a clear study, for example, where we're getting higher uh, levels on these, on these more stringent endpoints. Um, in terms of whether these higher uh, levels of efficacy matter, I think there was pretty well consensus among the group that we spoke today that it does matter. And it matters because it matters to patients. As you achieve higher levels of efficacy, you will see that these patients um, are happier. And you can measure that with DLQI, that you get a zero or a one in a higher proportion of these patients who go from POSI 75 to POSI 90 to POSI 100. So it matters because it matters to patients. All right. The other elements that we talked about that were different as we compared these molecules uh, related to perhaps other items uh, such as psoriatic arthritis, such as specific areas like the scalp, the nails. Uh, we looked at other areas like pediatrics, um, flexibility of dosing and accessibility. Uh, in the U.S., uh, Mark Lebwall uh, mentioned that um, access uh, can be not defined necessarily by efficacy, but by what payers are going to agree to give. And that is not at all a clear relationship as to how that happens. It may not be defined, whether it's cost that drives it, whether there's agreements that happen between payers, and that can change and can result in switches. So really, I think it's, it's a fairly complicated um, algorithm, if you will, that results in the ultimate choice of these molecules that can go well beyond the standard efficacy metrics. And I think the discussion that we had to me was, was fascinating in that regard. Now, I didn't talk about the new P19, the interleukin-23 molecules. Um, and the reason for that is that data is embargoed uh, until a few hours. So I'll leave you with that and maybe perhaps come back and talk about the interleukin-23s and how they are going to compare to the interleukin-17s and to the TNF antagonists, which really essentially is the state of, uh, of the field in terms of uh, the choice uh, and the choices that we have for patients.